Disney is known to try their best to uphold a very lighthearted and child-friendly public image. But there are some very disturbing stories from their past, and the two we'll be discussing today involve animal abuse. If you were a late 90s kid, the Air Bud films were likely a staple of your VHS collection. And as the 2000s rolled around, the series went in a puppy-centric direction as it morphed into Air Buddies. The series is beloved for the typical family-friendly fun one can expect from movies of this caliber. What wasn't expected, however, is how dark some of the consequences were for producing its various installments with such young animals. In particular, the majority the majority of these issues arose during the filming of Snow Buddies, set in the ice-cold climate of Alaska, which will be the focus of our discussion today. This story begins in the lower mainland of Vancouver, British Columbia, where the straight-to-video release was being filmed. As protocol with any production involving animals, the film crew were visited by a representative of the American Humane Association on the first day of shooting. This organization is responsible for the No Animals Were Harmed in the making of this film disclaimer seen at the end of many productions. There was already some conflict over the dogs chosen to be cast though. The AHA recommended the producers only import puppies older than 14 weeks of age, as health complications can often arise when they are separated from their mothers too young. And this is where the problems began to arise, as all 15 of the puppies on set were aged approximately 8 weeks, meaning that they'd been transported at only a month and a half of age. This not only appeared to be illegal, but extremely dangerous for the animals, particularly in regards to this specific project. At the time, Vancouver had been dealing with an outbreak of parvovirus for the past six months, a highly contagious disease that primarily affects puppies, and it can be from a week to ten days after exposure that symptoms start. For reference, it mostly affects dogs less than six months of age, and the most severe cases are seen in those younger than 12 weeks old. The mortality rate in untreated cases can reach up to 91%, though thankfully vaccines can prevent infection. Unfortunately, even though the Air Buddies did get this vaccine, it takes two weeks before it's effective, and consequently would not be much of a help in the early days of the filming. The crazy thing is, they wouldn't even realize the implications of this until later on, as 15 dogs on set showed signs of other types of illness, causing the 30 puppies in total to be taken to veterinarians for a wellness check. They were eventually diagnosed with having two different parasites, and due to intestinal complications, three of these dogs had to be euthanized. The rest were retired from filming and placed in new adoptive homes, as the crew replaced them with 28 slightly older golden retriever pups. But as it turns out, this would only be the start of the complications. Though admittedly older than the first litter, these new buddies had been transported before the aforementioned parvovirus vaccine became effective. Because of this, all 28 of the replacements would be exposed to the illness with six becoming sick and five passing away due to the disease. It was only then that the production was suspended, as they finally began complying fully with the American Humane Association. There was much debate following this over who was responsible for the puppy's tragic demise. Disney, as well as the AHA, primarily blamed the breeders. In particular, they targeted Alex Shock, the New York-based kennel owner who provided them their first litter. He was even accused of falsifying documents to transport the animals without having them inspected by veterinarians. He revealed that Disney's production company allegedly had asked for dogs between the ages of 6 to 7 weeks of age, meaning they'd explicitly requested him to break the law. Alex then claims that they informed him that their plan was to train the puppies for two weeks, and then film for an additional two weeks before returning them. Meanwhile, Shock pleaded ignorance, pointing out that he hadn't obscured their ages and marked them clearly on the forms. He was quoted as stating, You are assuming that Disney and their production company are going to be taking care of these animals like kings and queens. Now I look like the evilest guy around. According to their contract, any puppies that weren't returned would necessitate the company to pay him $1,000 in restitution. Given that they were placed in new adoptive homes, this meant Shock was owed upwards of $25,000, which he filed a lawsuit against Disney for. 
He alleged that they continued to use the puppies for the production, even while they required IV drips between periods of filming. It is not publicly known how this suit was resolved. In spite of organizations such as PETA attempting to rally for its distribution to be cancelled, Snow Buddies eventually was completed and released roughly a year after the first three dogs on set were euthanized. It's estimated to have made over $50 million in domestic DVD sales alone, overshadowing the morbid reality that haunted the production. To this day, most are unaware of how troubled filming for the movie actually was, showing just how adept Disney is at moving past their less magical moments. However, this wasn't the first case in which neglect on one of the company's sets led to the harming of animals. And in fact, the next story we're going to discuss is even more disturbing, as it was intentional. We'll learn more about this after a brief word from our sponsor. Most young men don't think about it, but studies show that two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. This is where Keeps comes into play. You go on their website and a licensed doctor will review your information online and recommend the right hair loss treatment plan for you. Once that's decided, your treatment will be shipped directly to your door every three months. Not just is Keeps simple, but it's also very affordable. Since they offer generic versions, of the FDA approved medications for hair loss, it makes it extremely inexpensive. Just keep in mind that Keeps treatment typically takes between four to six months to start seeing results, and it's also important to act fast. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you can save. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com GFM, or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. Again, that's keeps.com slash Slash GFM. Even though most well known for their animation, another long lasting subdivision of Disney's brand has been nature documentaries, with dozens in their discography. While more recent efforts have been praised for the footage they had captured, in hindsight that can't be said for some of the older productions. To explain what I mean, we'll have to go all the way back to the 1950s with White Wilderness, a documentary produced by Walt himself that showcased natural life throughout the North America. Arctic. It was the 13th installment in their True Life Adventure series. Filmed over the course of three years in Canada, upon its release in 58, it received widespread critical acclaim, even winning several awards, including Best Documentary Feature at the Oscars. Reviews also spoke glowingly of Disney and the filmmakers, with a writer for the Los Angeles Times stating that, The master of unusual entertainment has struck gold, for this is probably the best of his many true-to-life films. Indeed, what was most impressive to both critics and casual watchers at the time was just how enthralling they were able to make reality seem, using just clever underscoring, editing, and a narration track by Winston Hibbler. And for the following decades, this legacy would remain, as White Wilderness continued to be praised as a classic in the nature documentary genre. However, as people began scrutinizing its content further, things would begin to change. You see, one of the sequences praised by critics was the highlighting of the behavior of lemmings. A creature unknown to most in the era of release, they're a species of rodents found in northern Canada who have evolved to remain active throughout the freezing winters. The documentary showcases their unique migration pattern, following a slice that found themselves near the Arctic shore. The narrator claims that due to instinct, the animals will always attempt to cross bodies of water which unfortunately can result in an unintentional mass suicide. This is then shown on screen as he makes the following claim. They reach the final precipice. This is the last chance to turn back. <laughs> Yet over they go, casting themselves bodily out into space. The idea of lemmings killing themselves in mass was a myth that existed prior to the documentary, but never before had it been captured on camera. 
Because of this, it wasn't questioned at all by critics. But as the years went on, those with a better understanding of the animal's behavior started to analyze the film, and they quickly realized several glaring issues with the footage. While lemmings can accidentally drown in attempts to cross bodies of water, it is a far cry from an instinctive mass suicide, instead being the consequence of mass dispersal. An example of the actual behavior was described by zoologist Gordon Jarrell. The classic example is in the Scandinavian mountains, where lemmings have been dramatically observed. They will come to a body of water and be temporarily stopped, and eventually they'll build up along the shore so densely that they will swim across. If they get wet to the skin, they're essentially dead. The Disney filmmakers likely heard of this rumor and decided to embellish it upon failing to capture footage of it occurring naturally. We know this because the specific type found in Western Canada and the ones used in the production were collared lemmings. Not only is there no record of this species committing suicide, but they aren't even said to migrate at all. It was upon this revelation that journalists began to investigate the actual validity of these supposed true life adventures. Their findings would eventually be presented to the public in 1982, through a documentary broadcasted by the Fifth Estate exposing the mistreatment of animals within Hollywood. They discovered that the scene was shot in landlocked Alberta, which wasn't a native habitat for the rodents. This also meant its supposed placement at the Arctic shore was a complete lie, actually taking place at the Bow River. In addition, the production only had a few dozen lemmings, which they'd purchased from local Inuit children. And finally, given that these lemmings weren't known for mass suicide or even migration, the only explanation for their behavior was that the cameramen had deliberately thrown innocent animals off the cliff and continued filming as they suffocated to their death in cold water. Even though the truth had been revealed, it was unfortunately too late for any meaningful repercussions to happen. The staging of the scene was legal at the time of filming, and it had now been over two decades since the last installment of the True Life Adventures series. The sad reality is that the filmmakers got away with it, even being awarded an Oscar for their negligence. To this day, it's not entirely clear how complicit Walt Disney and other higher-ups were in these practices, with most claiming ignorance when confronted. After all, what many don't realize is that this genre of nature documentary only became feasible after Disney's series, something even credited in the Fifth Estate's expose. To this very day, the myth that lemmings fall off of cliffs persists in the world, with there even being a popular video game based around the false premise. And while one may expect its infamy to cause the film to be disavowed, Vowed, from our research, Disney has surprisingly neglected to make any definitive statements. When first confronted in the original expose, they were able to plead ignorance, but this defense won't protect them from the fact that they continue to profit from it to this day. White Wilderness is still currently available to rent and even appeared on Disney Plus when it first debuted. Gruesome lemming scene intact. From the best of our understanding, since then it's disappeared and reappeared on the streaming site yet another time, possibly hinting at some behind-the-scenes dispute over the ethics of republishing. Regardless, it's a far cry from how many would expect them to treat such an unethical production, given the measures taken to obfuscate Song of the South. It'll be interesting to see if Disney will at some point in the future make an official statement on where they stand with White Wilderness. I would love to say that these are the only two instances of animals dying in Hollywood, but that unfortunately is not the case, and maybe we'll discuss some of these other stories another time. But until then, I think I'll end the video here. So until next time, thanks for watching.